during the week. I invite you to let us know that you've been a part of this gathering, in this fellowship, drop us a comment, hit that like button, just something to let us know that you did join us in fellowship here today. A couple of announcements. We have uh, the September calendars are available, as well as the new upper rooms are for September and October are available for pickup. So if you didn't get one of those last week, be sure you get one of those today. Are there other announcements that need to be made? If not, let us begin our time together with the call to worship that is printed in your bulletin. I invite you to stand as you are able as we share in the responsive reading. We can trust God. God loves all the people. We can depend on God. God calls us to do the same. Come, let us worship and praise our loving, steadfast God. Amen. This morning, as I always do, I had written an opening prayer to share with y'all. And as I was driving in this morning, a song came on the radio. That, that song has come on and moved me. And this morning it came on again, and I have not heard it since the last time I shared that with you. And it truly brought me to tears in light of the illness and death of the oh so hard week we have all endured the suffering and national disasters, the Hurricane Ida and her destruction and devastation, and the wildfires and the flooding that's still impacting lives in Waverly and up in our Northeast. It is overwhelming in these days. So instead of the opening prayer that I have planned, I ask you to bow as I share the lyrics to a song. Hear our cry, Lord, we pray. Our faces down, our hands are raised. You called us out, we turned away, we turned away. With shipwrecked faith, idols rise, we do what is right in our own eyes. Our children now will pay the price. We need your light, Lord, shine your light. If ever we needed you, Lord, it's now, it's now. We're desperate for your hand, we're reaching out, we're reaching out. All our hearts, all our strength, with all our minds, we're at your fate. May your kingdom come in our hearts and lives. Let your church arise. Let your church arise. If ever we needed you, Lord, it's now. Lord, it's now. We're desperate for your hand. We're reaching out, reaching out. We're reaching out. If we ever needed you, Lord, it's now. We're desperate for your hand. We're reaching out. If we ever needed you, Lord, it's now. We're desperate for your hand. We need you now. Revive us now. We need you now. Amen. Our opening hymn is morning is a new song for us. It's found in the very small hymnal that Faith We Sing, the little soft back hymnal. It's on page 2020. It's a new praise song for us. Praise the Lord with the sound of trumpet. And Gary is going to, Gary and uh, Jacob will play through it once. Gary will sing the first verse. After that, we will join together singing verses 1 and 2.
Lord in the field and forest. Praise the Lord in the city square. Praise the Lord any time and anywhere. Praise the Lord in the wind and sunshine. Praise the Lord in the dark of night. Praise the Lord in the rain or snow or in the morning light.
Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done that which is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless in your judgment. Behold, you desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Make me hear with joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. Deliver me from death, O God, God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. For you have no delight in sacrifice. Were I to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. Our hymn of faith this morning is on 454. We'll be singing, Open My Eyes That I May See, and we'll be singing all three verses.
Wow. 
love and grace. Care for each one in your infinite wisdom. And now, God, we offer to you our own lives of discipleship and the life of this church. Lord, where there is weariness, give a renewed sense of energy. Where there is apathy and burnout, give a renewed sense of purpose and an extra dose of passion and purpose. Where there is fear and uncertainty, Lord, bring courage and faith. Where there is need and want, Lord, please provide. Remind us this day of our calling to be your presence of love and light in this broken and hurting world. Empower us, equip us, and send us, Lord. Send us. And now, God, we join our voices in prayer as we pray the words that our most perfect example, your Son, taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. When there is hatred, let your love increase. Make us your instruments of your peace. Walls of pride and prejudice shall cease. When we are your instruments of peace, where there is hatred, we will sow his love. Where there is injury, we will never judge. Where there is striving, we will speak his peace to the people crying for relief. We will be your instruments of peace. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let your love increase. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Walls of pride and prejudice shall cease. When we are your instruments of peace. Where there is blindness, we will pray for sight. Where there is darkness, we will shine your light. Where there is sadness, we will bear their grief. To the millions crying for relief, we will be your instruments of peace. We will be your instruments of peace. Of your peace, of your peace, of your peace. Thank you, Jerry. That is beautiful. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of James. I'll be reading the first 13 verses. 
yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But if you have dishonored, but you have dishonored the poor, is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. But whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When our kids were little, before William was born, each one of the three kids had a framed toy hanging on the wall in their bedrooms. The one in Robert's room started out like this. Dear oldest child, I love you best. And then it went on to list things that are special about being a firstborn. One of them was, I love you best because you made me a mom. Mary Lee had one in her bedroom that read, Dear middle child, I love you best. And then that was followed with another list, some of which included, because you keep us on our toes. And then Anna had one in her room that read, Dear youngest child, I love you best. And it was followed with another list. And one of them was, Because you'll always be our baby. But then God surprised us with William. And that whole birth order and middle child thing went out the window. <laughs> Playing favorites. Loving best, showing partiality. Those are a key focus of our text for today. Today we jump back into the book of James. It's our second week in this journey through James's letter to the Jewish Christians that were scattered throughout the Roman Empire. And if you remember from last week, this letter is what I call a sort of how to live a life of faith manual. Letter, Jesus, the younger brother, is teaching us, as one scholar put it, how to develop a working faith that is basically done by working your faith, doing your faith, putting your faith in action, putting your faith into practice, making it real, making it count. What today's text has to say to us. I want you to hear that first verse again. My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? Wow. Right off the bat, it sounds like James is questioning the sincerity and validity of our faith. It sounds like he's basically asking, can you really call yourself a Christian if you play favorites and show partiality to one person and turn around and dislike someone else? Now one of the problems with translating the New Testament is that there was no punctuation 
in the original Greek language. So that question that James starts with might actually have been a statement. In fact, in some translations, it reads just that way. It reads as a statement. One says, my brothers and sisters, believers in our Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Another reads, hold the faith of our glorious Lord Jesus Christ without acts of favoritism. Hold the faith. That puts a little bit of a different slant on that first verse, I think. Instead of asking us if we're really Christians, James encourages us to show our faith by the way we treat people equally, fairly, and impartially. This is another example of why I call James that sort of how to live a life of faith letter. So let's look at what James tells us about a life of faith today. James says that one way to live out your faith is by treating everybody, everybody, fairly and impartially. Now whether you think of this verse as a challenging question or an encouraging statement, one thing is clear. Favoritism and partiality in our lives and in our church is wrong. It seems that maybe this early group of Christians, the early church, had just as much trouble in their lives as our world today. You know, when it comes to ignoring the poor, treating people unfairly, showing favor to the rich, James writes that there should not be any distinction. Because showing partiality to one person or another person hurts the individual, both individuals, it divides the community, and it tears down God's kingdom. Playing favorites rips apart the body of Christ, and it damages our own kingdom-building witness that we try to live out in the world. Besides, when we show favor to the rich or partiality at the expense of the poor, we go against every single thing Jesus taught. Throughout Scripture, we find over and over again that God honors the poor and the oppressed, not the powerful, not the oppressors. Basically, playing favorites, showing partiality goes against the very gospel message itself. And that's what I want us to explore today. The problem with partiality. And how partiality is in direct opposition to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think that there's a Three very sobering truths about partiality and how it relates to the gospel. First off, faith in Christ is incompatible with partiality. If you look up the word incompatible, you find synonyms like opposite to, conflicting with, or poles apart. A life of faith is opposite to partiality. It is impossible to live a life of true faith while at the same time judging or playing favorites or showing partiality. James gives a very specific example in verses 2 to 4. Two people walk into the early church. And one of them is clearly well off, while the other one, not so much. And so these people come in, and he says, if you treat them differently because of their appearance, verse 4 asks, are you not making 
that we have no place in judging others. In Matthew and Luke and John, Jesus told his disciples, literally, do not judge lest you be judged. And Paul wrote about the dangers of judging other people in his letter to the Romans. Showing favoritism, partiality, that sits you right up in that judgment seat. And judging others is in direct opposition to the gospel message. Secondly, a problem with partiality is that it goes against God's command for us to love our neighbor. Judging and favoritism and partiality, they are incompatible with and opposite to the law of love. Jesus says that. I mean, James says that in verse 8. He says, you do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. And then he quotes, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That is, of course, Jesus' great commandment. It comes from the Gospel of Matthew. Remember, a rich young man asked Jesus, which is the greatest commandment in all the law? And Jesus replied, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. That is the great and first commandment. And then he adds, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now this was not a new law. This was not the first time the followers of Christ had heard this. This was not new to the children of God. The Old Testament book of laws, Leviticus, recorded the same commandment back centuries before. It says in Leviticus, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So loving our neighbor is kind of a big deal. It's a directive. It's a commandment. Not a suggestion. It's the law. It, it's actually the very heart of who we are as people of faith. It's the heart of of the gospel message. So James tells us in verse 9, if you show partiality, you commit a sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. That's pretty black and white. Playing favorites and showing partiality and judging others goes completely and breaks God's law of love. And so that transitions us right into the third point I want us to make about a serious problem with partiality. And that third point might be the hardest one to hear. There will be consequences. Those are the words we read in verses 12 and 13. And I want you to hear it to hear them again. And this time I'm going to read them in the New Living Translation. So whatever you say and whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful... God will be merciful when he judges you. Y'all, at the end of the day, we are commanded to love. It's that pure and it's that simple. Just love. And that doesn't mean just love your family or just love those who look like 
everyone all the time. And to do otherwise goes completely against God's will for us as God's children. To do anything other than that is just plain wrong. And to do anything other than that, James says, will result in consequences. So to wrap this up, if you are treating people differently, no matter where it is, not just the example of here in church, but if you treat people differently at Walmart, on the street, at a restaurant, Wherever you find yourself, if you judge, if you treat someone differently because of the way they look or the way they act or the way they smell, maybe it's their appearance or how you think they can benefit you, then you are doing exactly what James warned us about in this text. And that is judging playing favorites, and practicing partiality. And y'all, that's a problem, and James tells us there will be consequences. Amen. We come now to a time where we share back with the church, giving God a portion of our gifts. If you are worshiping with us remotely, I do invite you to please send in your offerings, your tithes, because the work of the church and our obligations continue, even though we are in the midst of such a difficult time. If you've not dropped your offering in the plate, I invite you to just raise your hand. Johnny will come by and you can drop it. Lord invites you to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. 
honored of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. The table is set. Come as you are ready. Thank you. 
and provider. May Christ Jesus dissolve all that the 